Hi and good afternoon and welcome to the what well, is going to be the second episode in the new season of Who's Zooming Who. And joining me this week is a colleague and very good friend of mine, Dr. Hazel Farrell. Hazel works in our department that was formerly known as Creative and Performing Arts uh, as a music lecturer. She's an accomplished musician herself uh, and is also the most recent recipient of the WIT Teaching Excellence Award. Uh, which she won for, amongst other things, um, bringing uh, a new online uh, five-credit music module called Western Arts Music. So we're going to talk to Hazel uh, a little bit this afternoon about her experience of teaching online, uh, both before the pandemic, during the pandemic, uh, and maybe uh, get an idea as to what it might be like after the pandemic as well. So good afternoon, Hazel, and you're very welcome, and thank you very much for agreeing to be my uh, next uh, victim on the uh, podcast. Perhaps you'd like to start by maybe introducing yourself and giving a far better introduction than, than I've given you. Well, do you know what? I thought you did a great job there all together. I'm very flattered. You made me sound very important or very good, you know, or something. So yeah, I'm happy with that. But yeah, so I'm Hazel and I suppose I started out as a hardcore analytical musicologist and headed down that pathway uh, sort of um, quite deeply. Um, and then I, in more recent years, I'm more on uh, an education buzz, I suppose. And um, uh, that probably stems from my PhD years up in Mary I in the teacher training college. So it was all about education uh, up there and I loved it. Um, and my association with Ken comes through uh, CTEL, of course, with yourself. And that's opened up a whole new world of possibilities for me. So, yeah, that's where I am now. Excellent. Thank, thanks very much. So just in, in getting started and again, I suppose in, in, in painting the picture in the background, you, you spoke about your your. Um, I can't even say analytical musicologist, um, yes. not, not with a straight face anyway. Um, it, it, <laughs> I'm not even sure what that is, but uh, getting back to your your, your uh, teaching experience and you, and you mentioned that the first time I suppose our paths would have crossed was when you were looking to bring this uh, elective five credit module online uh, with the grand title of Western Arts Music or Western Art Music. Um, maybe you'd like to give uh, a bit of background on how that came to being um, who would say that and what the what the um, I suppose the whole rationale behind it was. Okay, so it originated because teaching council registration regulations changed and all of a sudden if you wanted to register as a music teacher you had to have a western art music module and our students uh, the profile is predominantly pop and jazz and so on so we found out that uh, our students were being caught out and they couldn't register with teaching council and again that's no good for any degree program any music degree program and it wasn't just us it happened throughout the whole country so all of the music departments were caught short so we had to act very very quickly and the additional problem was our students at this point, our fourth year students were coming up to graduation. So there was no time even to put in an extra module. So uh, I felt that the best way to do this would be to put it online and therefore it would be um, a lot more accessible um, and the flexible delivery would suit them because they no longer would have been full-time students. Um, and it's evolved from there. So now we offer it as an elective um, for years two and three on the degree course, but it also goes out to um, part-time education and this affords students from around the country or um, students who have gone abroad to take their music degree and then need to come back and you know catch up on modules and things it gives them the chance to access it as well so that was the whole thinking behind it. Brilliant and, and the module is running by my estimation for three or possibly this might be his fourth year now yeah, um, and it's entirely online so um, may, maybe it might like to sort of outline, um, I suppose, the structure of the module and how it would differ um, from what you would have been used to teaching um, before when it was an on-campus uh, experience as opposed to an online experience. Mm. 
Well, this one worked out quite well because, as we know, there are like four main eras in Western art music. So it worked out beautifully um, because in the 12 week semester, I could dedicate three weeks to each of those. Um, so I divided it up like that and uh, I made presentations for every week, uh, backed up by resources and then quizzes as well to sort of support the learning. And um, these were all uh, loaded up onto Moodle and then a schedule of live, of live classes were planned as well to complement these and to reinforce the learning. Um, and then a whole load of other collaborative tools like Padlets and uh, different things like that as well, uh, discussion forums um, and different mechanisms to engage the students. And I think this is possibly um, the main issue with online learning is to um, catch that engagement. And then I suppose my quest there to engage the students then led on to more things because I've been on a student engagement buzz for um, a good few years now at this stage. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's, it, 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 it sounds uh, really, really good. And I suppose, look, um, I have an unfair advantage to some of our listeners or some of our viewers in that I've actually seen the module. So um, although I still struggle to uh, grasp the musical concepts, but then again, uh, I'm not an analytical musicologist, so I, 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 I don't need to. So I, I'm guessing from the way you've explained your background, um, that this was a big change for you in terms of how you would have thought um, prior to getting involved in this module. Um, so it, it's, it made you, I suppose, step outside your comfort zone a small bit. Has much of what you would have done within that module kind of seeped into your other day-to-day -day teaching or is that still completely separate or completely different or do you see do you see them as two different things or um does it get a little bit blurry the definition between on campus and online yeah, it's definitely seeped over and for the good, I have to say, you know, I, I mean, I work really hard at um, my visuals now, you know, and as you well know, I'm pretty much into the aesthetics and how things look and then how students perceive them. Um, so I have really taken that from the online work and brought it into my um, face to face delivery as well. I've also brought along all of the collaborative um, ideas and developed more and I've opened up the whole assessment uh, type of area as well where there's a lot more collaboration and just exploring innovative approaches to assessment because before it was always oh submit an essay sit, sit an end of semester exam that was it you know so now um, I do a lot more than that where I use an awful lot of different types of assessments and my most recent experiment um, was with my fourth year students where um, I got them to um, make uh, an infographic as part of their assessment so they were researching a contemporary music topic and they made an infographic and they presented on it and then they uploaded it into uh, an e-portfolio I created to put those together so that would have been sort of one of my latest uh, experiments with um, different assessment types. Brilliant and look assessment um, I think for a lot of people moving online for the first time and, and, and now that um, with the emergency remote teaching over the last 12 months because um, we're coming up on the 12 month anniversary um, of, of our campus has been effectively closed. Um, assessment has been one of the areas that people have probably struggled most with um, in that there was a certain comfort or familiarity, I guess, in terms of having people walk into exam halls and sit down and do terminal exams. And there was also a certain comfort, as you said, in, in that you know people had an essay to write. Um, so it's really interesting to hear about the alternative um, methodologies that, that you're employing um, for assessment. And I do think um, one of the things that's incumbent on all of us working in the space um, is to use the tools and technologies to reimagine um, and, you know, rather than just try and replicate what we were doing before, except doing it online. Um, to try and reimagine how it might be difficult. I, I think as well, um, and if I could take you back to the module, and, and again, I'm going to share this with, with the, 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 the people that might be uh, watching and, and uh, listening to, to the podcast. Um, you, you've kind of sold yourself a little bit short in that um, you, you, you describe it as you, you, you divided the, the four 
music year is over the 12 weeks, but it's a little bit more than that as well, and that you put a lot of um, work into putting together good pre-recorded um, lectures and, and um, good pre-recorded um, uh, presentations in a variety of formats. Uh, and then those coupled with the quizzes um, allowed you to get a good understanding of where students were getting stuck in the material. Um, and, and then, uh, again, I suppose, unlike a lot of our classes that have moved online on an emergency basis, your schedule of online classes for that 12-week module, I think you had four live online classes. Um, and from being involved in, in the initial run of it, and I'm guessing it's kind of similar since, they were kind of where you, you used some of the data that you garner, garnered from the quizzes and from how students interacted with the material to actually tailor those online classes to the bits that people were getting stuck in. Um, so it wasn't, you know, you, you very much took advantage of um, the affordances of the medium um, rather than just moving 12 online classes and having classes each week. You allowed people to, to, to consume the material at their own pace, although it was on, on a timed release. Um, but your touch points with them were every couple of weeks or via the forums or via Padlets and, 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 and structures like that. So again, I think... Um, you're selling yourself slightly short in 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 saying that you just moved it online because it, there's a, there's I'm a, taking it all for granted now. You yeah. see, I'm, I, it's all old hat to me now because I'm doing it so often. But I think you know when you're saying about taking it online, that's the one thing that I sort of um, I I I don't know. I struggle with that a little bit because I think you know the taking the classroom stuff online is the very wrong thing to do. You know, I really think it needs to be redesigned and as you said, these creative approaches and all the rest of it and there is also that thing you know when people are online you can't expect them to uh, be there all the time like just listening to it they need that time to absorb the materials and that's another thing that I feel very strongly about is you know sometimes people tend to overdo it on the technology and I think just because you know how to do all of these different things doesn't mean you should be doing all of them I think that it's just as important to actually select you know, the tools that are going to be most effective. And um, I think pair it back, actually. Mm -hmm. That's really the direction I'm heading in yeah. anyway. You know? No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it's um, it's the philosophy of sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you certainly don't want people overburdened um, and, and sort of um, have that cognitive overload where, they just don't know what direction to go in or where to go or what it is they're supposed to do. Um, so I do think, you know, less is more, but using that less more effectively uh, is possibly the way to go. What I'm really interested in as well is, and you mentioned that this is the fourth year now that this module has run. So winding the clock back a year um, to March of 2020, when um, they, they, uh, campus closed and you suddenly found yourself uh, and along with all of your colleagues uh, in an emergency remote teaching situation. I, I'm taking it as a given that your experience on this module helped better prepare you for the pandemic. Um, was that something that you evidenced yourself or, or that you noticed yourself that it, that it didn't feel as big a challenge as perhaps maybe it might otherwise have been? Yeah, I was very lucky. I was very lucky because I knew what I was doing. And the thing is, from the first run of the Western Art Music module a few years ago, I had started to convert other modules into much more accessible formats. And I was redoing all of my lectures and stuff. So I stopped lecturing. I always go on about this as well. I, I think lecturing is not the right thing to do. And I was redesigning all of my materials. So I was taking them a module at a time and I was doing that work over 
over on them. And I had had a few years uh, to be able to uh, sort of engage with that process. Now, I have to say I wasn't totally and utterly there at all, but I was well ahead of the game. And then the other thing uh, that um, I suppose was very was more difficult for me um, would uh, be the practical modules, you know, because I have one with first years. It's a composition module. And my third years, I'm teaching uh, contemporary analysis. Um, so that took me a few goes to sort of get into the swing of, you know, so I started, um, you know, po posting scores up on the screen, like sharing the screen and using annotate and then enabling uh, annotate for the students as well. So they could take turns actually, you know, working out chords or putting in melodies. And I actually think it was very good because um, that collaborative learning experience really helped them and it brought them all along together, you know, so I'm still fine tuning that and I was just saying um, to uh, you earlier on there that I am after ordering a visualizer and I think this will help because I'll be able to actually you know do some of the composition exercise and they can see it evolving on the screen in front of them so I think that will actually enhance um, those type of practical modules as well you know. Yeah no and, and as you mentioned um, and I suppose by extension we were talking about students but now that you brought them directly in front and center and you mentioned that they were working collaboratively with you uh, on annotating uh, your music scores how do you think it has been for students um so you know for effectively the last year they haven't been on campus or if they have it's been um to a minimal extent um What's been your experience in, in dealing with and talking to students and working with students as to how they're finding, you know, most of most of the conversations I've had um, on this series of podcasts have been with educators like yourself. And I'm looking at it from an educator's point of view. But now that you're mentioning students, I'm interested to know what how they're feeding back to you, because um, you, you, you probably work more collaboratively with students than uh, many, many other lecturers may do. Well, I have to say our students are bloody brilliant. They're fantastic. They have jumped on board and they're so creative and they have really embraced it. Now, right now there's fatigue and that's why I'm having my screen free week this week because the students were slumping as well as the rest of us. So they're still working and they have all of their communications and their uh, work uh, up on Moodle, but we're just not Zooming this week to give them a little chance. Um, but the other thing with regard to the students is that they have have gained a lot of skills that they wouldn't have if we were in the classroom and yes that has to do with digital literacy but for us it also has very sort of industry specific skills like um, you know recording and streaming and using music software like acapella and iMovie and making ensemble videos I mean they were uploading performance videos like they were making at home in their own living room I, I looked at one uh, performance exam and I Honest to God, I think the girl was actually in the bathroom to get the best acoustic. You know, she was playing a classical guitar. They have been absolutely amazing, you know, and some of them are out there and they're finding out new things and sharing it with me. You know, one of the first years the other day was able to say to me, you know, Hazel, if you press this button, it means all of us can do this at the same time instead of that. Whereas I was doing it one at a time, you know, so the students are learning stuff. They're passing it on to us. We're learning stuff. And there's there definitely is a feeling that we're in it together. And I think that's because we work extremely hard at that on in music, you know, with our Zoom assemblies every week with everybody in there. We really have a very strong community spirit, you know, and I sent them all a postcard this week from the, the Brian Mathers Visual Thinkery Seminar. Um, so one of his remixes, I made them all a postcard and sent it to them and just made my own music stamp and a little picture of my scene down here and looking forward to seeing you all and all the rest of it. And I made a Trump card as well, you know, what my profile and I sent it out and I said, you know, guys, if you want to send back some of these, we'll make a collection of them. And, you know, they're brilliant. We, we, we better just qualify just for people that might know it's not a Donald Trump card. No, it's oh, like, sorry. No, yeah, no, it's, it's, top, it's, Trump. it's top Trumps. Yeah, top Trumps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple there's a couple of things you mentioned there that 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 I'm really interested in. So you mentioned that this is a screen-free week. Um yeah. 
maybe I'd like to elaborate on what, what you mean by that. And, and I feel guilty now because I have you on, on a screen. Um, well, this is meant to be a screen free week. So, um. uh, no, no, I don't mind that at all. No, it's the classes because, you know, I think if a student actually elected to do an online course, they wouldn't have every single class online, you know, as a, you know, a normal schedule like they would if they were um, on campus. They have to have time to absorb the materials and they have to have time to get away from this type of environment because it's sucks the life out of you in some sense like looking at yourself on screen or having to tune in for so long you know so I tend to try keep my classes as, uh, as brief as I can I try to you know get through it do what we need to do and get out of there there's none of this keeping them online for three hour blocks because it's actually not right it's mm-hmm. not good practice and it's not fair on the students but over the last couple of weeks the students were expressing um the sort of uh, this sort of fatigue they were tired they were finding it hard to focus and the attendance was dropping off a bit so we had a little chat and I said how would you feel about that and they were like oh yes please you know so um so each lecturer really we couldn't make it a program decision because it's against um the institute policy to do a blanket sort of week but we were individually able to say I'm going to be doing it this week and someone else will do it this week as well and just to give everyone a break come back refreshed and the other reason for that is because we would have nine weeks straight with sure. no midterm or anything and it's just not sustainable to yeah. keep up that energy level so there's a very long answer now to that one no 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 it's it, and it's a it's a very good answer and i think it's 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 a point um well made and it's a point worth reinforcing i mean we are starting to see studies come out now about zoom fatigue uh one of the apparently one of the reasons we feel this zoom fatigue is that we're not used to holding eye contact um, uh, for as long or we're not used to looking at ourselves for long. Um, I do say that I was tired of looking at myself years ago. So um, I, was, I, was, I was probably slightly ahead of the game on that one as well. The second thing you mentioned there and um, some of the people possibly tuning in and, and watching and listening may well have been at the National Forum Funded uh, Seminar that you hosted last week with Brian Mathers, who you just mentioned from Visual Tinkery. Um, You mentioned that you used his remixer machine to send your postcards and uh, the top Trump cards. Perhaps maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit more about that event and and what uh, what prompted you to uh, reach out, I suppose, and and see if we could get Brian to uh, join us, albeit virtually. Yeah, it's my quest for this student engagement uh, thing, reach, you know, the ultimate in student engagement. It has led me down the visual path. Uh, you know, and there's so much research out there about how we engage people far more using visuals rather than just, you know, talking at people and, or else, you know, big text heavy um, things. So I have another um, project I'm involved in at the moment as well, another National Forum funded project. And it's about um, transforming the student handbook into a visual and more visually engaging um, format. And it's uh, it's basically acknowledging the visual culture that we're part of now, you know, because I always feel as educators, for us to just stick with what we always did you know that's very very wrong you know we have to evolve we have to stay current we have to move with the students and you know that's the type of culture we exist in so with our handbook that's a text document and it just outlines all the modules everything they have to do all the rest of it but I'd say nobody even looks at the thing nobody has probably ever read it so um, that was my idea was to transform this into a visual type of format where you're using imagery and icons and and simplifying the whole thing. So they basically look at the sheet and they say, okay, what's this module about? What do I have to do to pass it? You know, it's that level of detail. So working pretty heavily on that. And that's where, um, uh, that's what led me to Brian Mathers. Brilliant. No, look, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, look, um, they do say a picture paints a thousand words. Um, I often wondered, could I just submit 20 pictures and would that count as a dissertation? But it probably it probably wouldn't. But you know what? Maybe it should. Um, uh, no, uh, for those of you who weren't at the event uh, last week, the recording of that um, will be available uh, on YouTube. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, Brian um, is a fabulous visual artist um, and does a much better job of explaining what he does than I possibly could. 
uh, but it was wonderful to uh, for Hazel to uh, bring him to um, bring him onto our screens, I guess, um, and for him to share some of his techniques uh, with us. It was a brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant workshop um, that was uh, enjoyed by by all. Um, and actually, one of the comments that Brian had to me afterwards was it's something that educators should maybe do every Friday. Um, but and it's not that I disagree with him. Um, I just don't know if we if we if we could get the funding from the forum to run it every Friday. Maybe, maybe we could. Uh, it'd be wonderful. Uh, it'd be a wonderful idea. So I suppose look, we've looked a little bit, Hazel, at what your own background was prior to kind of um, starting to, to to teach online. Um, what your experience of teaching online was before the pandemic and how that helped better prepare you um, to cope during um, the last 12 months. Trying to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing and looking towards the future. Um, and, and I know, look, it's, it's, a, it's an almost impossible question because if I asked you 12 months ago to predict this, you couldn't have done it. Uh, nobody could. Um, but what are the things that have happened over the last 12 months or, or longer, but particularly the last 12 months, that you'd like to see stick? So what are the things, what are the changes that have happened that you'd like to see? Yeah, that, that you know what, that, that's worked out good. Um, I'd like to keep doing that even when we go back to primarily on-campus teaching. Yeah, I think um, assessment will be a big thing for me. So definitely keep the students actively involved in the decision making processes around assessments, because I fully believe it has to be meaningful for them and then give them that broad spectrum, you know, of choice. So we're not just catering for one type of learner. You know, I'm pretty passionate about, you know, sort of grabbing all of the different learner types and specifically visual ones as well. So assessment type will um, be broadened out for me um also my delivery i think um it will be very valid to actually have some online um sessions or remote sessions is that the right terminology i'm even using that i mean we don't have to be in the classroom mm. all the time and this has proven it really and it takes pressure off of students who have to work who have family commitments who have everything you know i mean students have so many demands on their time these days so i think that flexibility is something that's very very important going forward in education um, as well and i'll keep um hammering on down the visual path and developing more infographics and more projects that can enhance our student engagement. And um, the other thing I have up my sleeve is um, I'm in the early stages of setting up a group with two other colleagues, and this would be um, heavily focused on student engagement initiatives. And we're having a specific look at e-portfolios and uh, things like that. So we're in the early stages, and uh, Ken is also going to be involved in that with us, aren't you, Ken? And um, then uh, we have a long-term plan with that to eventually broaden it out once we have consolidated uh, what we're doing ourselves. You know, so lots of exciting plans. I, I guess I am now, seeing as you've um, you put, put it on, on, on You're my records. wingman, or the, although no, I said to you the other day, you're actually Batman and I'm Robin, I think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, you, 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 you can be Batman. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I don't think I've been called Batman before. I'm actually almost after even forgetting what the next question was going to be. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no it, 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 it's okay. It probably wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> no, look, it's 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 really interesting that you want to keep all of those bits that you've seen that have changed over the last uh, tw 12 months. Uh, and definitely, um, I know from speaking with a lot of teaching colleagues, not just within WIT, but across the, the, the wider sector, um, that this kind of interaction um, has become almost as commonplace, if not more commonplace than phone calls. Now, nobody rings each other anymore. They, 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 they use Zoom or Teams or, or whatever um, mechanism um, where I'm sure a year or two ago, if I said to you, let's have a, a Zoom call, you, you would have looked at me as if I was... Um, uh, slightly mad what bits of 
the on-campus experience? And I suppose this is the, the, the other side of that question. And maybe it's it's hard to know because sometimes over the last 12 months, we've kind of forgotten. Um, so what bits of the on-campus experience would you not like to see come back? Right? So, um, yeah, it was a kind of a double negative. Almost, I was here going, what? what did he actually yeah, say? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, what would I not like to see come back? Hmm. I'm not sure, Ken. Um, not too sure about that one. Um, you see, I think that this type of experience has put a lot of things in perspective and it helped us to filter out the stuff that actually wasn't really important, that maybe we were putting too much emphasis on such a thing or we we're putting too much pressure on students in a certain respect or, you know, and there was this, um, I think the strictness around, you know, you must be here and you have to do this and you have to, that type of thing. I, I Really, for me, it's this flexibility and the accessibility that I'm enjoying and I would not like to go back to an environment where it's back to you know the students have to be here from this time to that time they have to do this type of assessment they have to do whatever I think that we've learned a lot from this you know and I think that uh, we've learned that we can let go a little bit you know mm -hmm. because a lot of people were hanging on to what they they were doing before like that they were delivering a specific way and they had to cover this topic and the assessment had to be like this and I think the fact that people were you know they were forced into position where they had to actually release it a bit i i really think that that has been very very positive mm. you know no no I, I i couldn't agree with you more and i think you put it very very well and uh, i suppose it's that old saying of necessity being the mother of invention and mm. you know it, it's amazing what you can do when you have to do it um yeah. you know a lot of the time when things are theoretical or possible um yeah, you know, you, you kind of said to yourself, I'll do it when I get a chance, but sure, whoever gets a chance. And you know what I just thought of actually, Ken, we, uh, with our music audition process, that was an awful process where, you know, the students, uh, the applicants would have to come down for a day and they do written papers and ear tests and then they do performance part. So they basically have to take a day out, you know, or else they'd come on a Saturday. And it was this, um, it was really a nightmare process where, again, we would be teaching at the same time and then trying to run all of this. But now, uh, last Last year when this whole remote thing happened it was exactly in March that this happens for us with regards to the auditions um, so we were able to put out that flexible option where the students could either submit um, an audition video or they could um, do a zoom audition and we were able to get rid of the written paper because we were saying actually what value is that mm. really you know, and the same thing with the ear tests. We were like, you know, they're doing this for leaving cert anyway. So why are we redoing it? So that's one perfect example of how we cut out the excess. We simplified the process. And now the students just click onto the WIT website. There's a Cognito form there and they just fill in whatever and then upload their video and or book a Zoom appointment. And we're definitely going to keep that one up. Because, you know, I mean, we were actually making students travel from all over the place and we were cutting out the international students who couldn't come mm -hmm. onto campus. So now we've opened up a whole new door for ourselves. And I'm really glad that we were allowed to do that. And now hopefully we can continue the practice, you know. Yeah. No, I, and I think you, you, you reinforced the point there that um, a lot of the time when we kind of get stuck in the way of doing things, we don't, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that every once in a while you should challenge those assumptions and say, well, why are we doing this? Uh, and is there a better way of doing it? I'm not saying you have to ask yourself that question every week. I'm not even saying you have to ask yourself that question every year. Mm -hmm. But I do think you have to ask yourself that question every once in a while and, and not just keep doing things um, the way you've always done them, because that's just how we do things around here. And um, it's, it's th that, that sort of mindset, I suppose, or that sort of mentality um, is an absolute uh, recipe for disaster in lots of areas, not just, not just in education. I'm conscious of we've been talking for probably close on a half an hour now, and uh, I promised I wouldn't keep you for too long, um, oh. but I, I, I am going to wrap up, but uh, I'm going to sort of put you slightly on the spot here now, um, 
because, and I haven't done this before in any of the rest of the Who's Only Who uh, episodes, but seeing as I'm talking to an analytical musicologist um, <laughs> and an accomplished musician, oh, yeah. if you were to pick one piece of music or one song um, from any era um, to give us hope from the pandemic we've just been in or for the future that we're looking towards, what would that song be? Our piece of music. See, you go song now because you're a DJ. Yeah, I'm well, a piece of song. music, whatever, whatever. Yeah, Just whatever. Hit me but with you something. know something? I don't know if it's something that gives hope, right? But one of my favorite pieces of all time has to be um, um, a piece called uh, The Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. And it's from um, a composer, uh, an Estonian composer called Goretsky, Heinrich Goretsky. And it is just the most beautiful uh, piece of music ever. So that's actually my favorite piece of music of all time. The second movement from The Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. I'm also very, very interested into um, Avril Part as well and uh, Spiegel im Spiegel is one of my favourite pieces and that's been used as a soundtrack for uh, loads and loads of movies. Really, really popular piece of music as well. So uh, minimalism is my thing, you know, because minimalism sells. Minimalism is the music that we can appreciate and you don't have to work hard at it, you know, it's just, you, you can just take it as it is. So yeah, that's my buzz, Ken. Yeah, the symphony of sorrowful, sorrowful, Songs, oh, songs, so yeah, it, it, I'm sure it probably is, but yeah, it doesn't have a kind of a very catchy name, though. I have to admit, but maybe, <laughs> it has I, sold I, millions of copies. I, I'm sure it has, time. yeah, I'm sure yeah. it has. I, I, I'll, I'll check all these out on, on YouTube, but I'll encourage um, our listeners to, to, to check them out as well. Um, <laughs> Dr. Hazel Farrell, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very, very much for your time, insight, and for sharing those little musical interludes at the end with us. Um, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Ken.